Okay. Well, let's go to God together. Merciful God, we give you praise and honor this day. You are uh, so good to gather us in and to give us uh, uh, a time with your word in which we can uh, uh, enjoy uh, what you do and say and how you move, but also uh, learn to uh, move with you, uh, to be in step with you in your spirit. This we pray in our strong name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, today and next week, hey, today and next week we're going to do humor. Today, uh, and so I, uh, I require that you laugh today. Uh, you shall. It says mandatory uh, humor. Mandatory laughter is required. By, the Bible says you have to laugh, doesn't it? It says we all uh, believe it. It ought to, don't you think? If we doesn't. I think Jim and I would, would, would say that. So this is uh, the first one that we're going to look at the, uh, today. Uh, this is um, Abraham and Sarah. Abram and Sarah. Sarai. Uh, then next week, uh, Numbers 22. Uh, the, the only time you get to say a cuss word in church. And Balaam's donkey, right? Balaam's ass. So uh, that's next week. And we get to... Uh, have a little fun with him too. See what in the world God was doing there. Uh, St. Thomas More wrote a, a, a prayer that he prayed uh, about good humor. And uh, I think it would be great for our prayer for illumination for today and next week. So uh, if you can read that aloud with me, let's pray this together. A prayer for good humor by St. Thomas More. Grant me, O Lord, good digestion, and also something to digest. Grant me a healthy body and the necessary good humor to maintain it. Grant me a simple soul that knows to treasure all that is good and that doesn't frighten easily at the sight of evil, but rather finds the means to put things back in their place. Give me a soul that knows not boredom, grumbling, sighs, and laments, nor excess of stress because of that obstructing thing called I. Grant me, O Lord, a good sense of humor. Allow me the grace to be able to take a joke, to discover in life a bit of joy, and to be able to share it with others. Amen. Amen. I like him. Good, good. I can imagine. All right. Uh, thanks to uh, Anna for blowing up the captions here because they were real small. Uh, this is uh, one of those things that we, we ask that ushers and greeters not do, and the security team is not supposed to do this in the service. Bob often provides spiritual direction to those disrupting the worship service. Okay. You want to sometimes? I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, and then, of course, we all love a good church meeting. And at this one, uh, the same cartoonist said that, so that's four votes to approve the minutes and one vote to simply tolerate them. <laughs> so. mm-hmm. All right. Among all of God's creatures, human beings are the only animals who laugh and weep. We are the only ones who are struck by the difference between the way things are and the way things ought to be. You ever thought about that? Reinhold Niebuhr was a 20th century theologian and ethicist, and he said the very essence of sin is to take ourselves too seriously. And he didn't just mean that it's good to have a sense of humor. He didn't just mean uh, don't um, be grouches or something like that. He meant, uh, he was actually pointing out that Jesus had some of his harshest criticisms for those who took them, thought themselves too righteous. Yeah, he does. In fact, Jesus really, you know, what, when we ask the question, what makes Jesus mad? What made Jesus mad? That's a good indication of what should or shouldn't make us mad. It was the people who took, thought themselves too righteous. Or, as Paul says in Romans 12, 3, you ought, quote, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. I know we know that verse from a uh, famous part of Romans 12 there. Uh, so humor is not just uh, the yuck-yuck and the joke, although that's important. And 
But in those examples uh, right there, for example, the, the humor is found in how uh, we, the difference between how we take ourselves and how, and how we uh, read the situation and how we really ought to read the situation. And the gap between those is, is the source of the, of the humor, isn't it? So humor occurs when, when we are put in our place. And that's something that the Bible does a lot. Uh, and it does so sometimes with the yuck yuck and the joke and the, you know, in that in that moment. But a lot of times it just does it in, in uh, with straight out direction. Uh, you have heard it said, but I say to you, or uh, something like that. It it comes out and just draws out the contrast. And again, while the joke is not necessarily embedded in that word or teaching or that verse, uh, it is an implicit <clears throat> part of it. It's the the gap between the way things are and the way things ought to be. And that comes up in the Bible so much. You think about um, Revelation, you know, and how God wins at the end, the end and, and uh, the trials and, and turmoils, and, and there's very little to find in there to, that just will make you go, ha, ha, but, you know, it's all this beast and all this stuff. But think about it. It was a people under oppression who were writing about how God is going to win in the end, and God is going to have, if you will, against evil, the last, what? Laugh. Yeah, you know where I'm going. You see me? You're with me? Good. It's the idea that the human situation is exposed, that the first will become last, and the last will be first. It's that whole, um, you know, profundity uh, that uh, is going on here. So that wise men look like fools and the people who are scary turn out to be the cowards. And we sing with Mary who sang uh, that God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud, right, in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. It's that comeuppance, that holy comeuppance that is the source of a lot of the humor in the Bible. So, now, let's understand, of course, there is a humor out there that is not of God. It, uh, there is uh, evil cynicism, sarcasm, ridicule, derision. Uh, everything funny does not come from God. Uh, we're not saying those are holy at all. Things like ethnic jokes and racist slurs and sexist ridicule. These are not funny to Christians, and they shouldn't be. We're talking about the kind of humor that tells the truth. A truth that is so true, often it is painfully true. And we laugh because we're not accustomed to seeing ourselves as we are. More fool than saint. When we see ourselves as holy fools, and when we can live into that... Um, Discipline, if you will, it is kind of a discipline. To, it's a, this is a spiritual discipline we're talking about. I don't know what you'd call it. I guess good humor, right? To see ourselves as holy fools, to look at ourselves and our situations in fresh ways. When we smile at our shortcomings instead of wringing our hands, we begin to enjoy ourselves more the way perhaps God enjoys and sees us. And maybe God enjoys us more too. So, we'll start with some, uh, with that introductory remark, we'll start looking at some scripture. Now, we're going to start with Genesis 17, 1 through 17, as well as 18, 1 through 15. These are two uh, bookends, if you will, two parts of this text, of this story, in which uh, there is laughing, and we will see kind of what the basis of that is, and, and then see what, uh, what, what, is, what, what is so funny about these. Genesis 17, 1 through 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face. Now here he fell on his face. Let's, let's kind of mark that, but it doesn't say he laughed about this one, okay? It said, And God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. 
You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come to you. I will establish my covenant between you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, now this happens a lot in the Bible, you get it stated and then the Bible writer said, especially in the, in the Torah, the Old Testament part, first books, they you usually had more than one kind of group that wanted to have their say, and they wanted to jump in and tell it their way too, so... So it's kind of a restating, uh, starting at verse 9. God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant. You shall, you and your offspring after you and throughout their generations. And now he's going to tell you what covenant you, that, that Abraham has to keep uh, between me and, and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Throughout your generations, every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, including the slave born in your house and the one bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Both the slave born in your house and the one brought with your, bought with your money must be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, now he says this. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face. Okay, wait, he's fallen back on his face again. And laughed this time. He definitely laughed. And said to himself, Can a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old, can Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? Now, Abraham's first, first response with the internal musing, and then here uh, he also responds with, their la with laughter based on the ages of them being a parent. And in this spot where it says he laughed, and later where we read that Sarah laughed uh, too, uh, those are, it's not coincidence, I don't think, that we hear that term because their son, Isaac, his name means he laughed, right, means he laughed. So there's a, uh, already the beginning of a, of a build-up here, a build-up like almost to a punchline or something, as if, as if the birth of Isaac is the punchline of the setup. And I, I don't mean that, there's nothing derogatory in that. He's the... He's the, you know, badoom to the, the rim shot, right? <clears throat> to <clears throat> this idea that nothing is impossible with God. There he is. Check him out. There he is, right? So he is the embodiment of the laugh. He is the embodiment of the, the joke, if you will, in a beautiful way, in a powerful way. Now, we read that Abraham fell on his face in obeisance uh, at first in verse 3, and then he falls on his face in laughter. His questions, when he asked these questions, did, what were they? And they're in verse 17. Can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? His su questions suggest that the laughter is incredulity. Uh, the questions help us understand why he laughed. Uh, because it's just, he sees it as biologically impossible for them to have a child. Uh, and he's bewildered. His laughter appears similar to Sarah's uh, that we'll read in a moment, demonstrating that Sarah was not told what he learns here. So, so somehow when the visitors come to Sarah in just a minute, uh, they... Uh, He's not gone and told her. We don't, we don't think what happened. But remarkably, 
God does not chide Abraham. Yeah. Um, considering when this was set, mm-hmm. how, what made Abraham know that there was a biological time clock? Mm-hmm. Well, remember, this is not Adam and Eve or something. This is, this is generations into, the, into time. You know, so I think they probably would have realized that at this, at this time, you know, at, the, at some point, nobody they knew had babies this old. Yeah, I would assume that's my that's my best. I don't know, but that's my assumption. That, and so um, yeah, it was, it was it was pretty obvious to them that um, that they didn't see how this was going to happen. So God does not chide Abraham. He simply says no uh, and speaks of a new son to be named Isaac uh, with whom God will establish the covenant. Okay? So we've got that story. Let's move on over to 18, 1 through 15. In fact, I think we're going to... Let me see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we may read down to Genesis 2, 18, 1 through 16, actually, but okay. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. It's a lot of setting, a lot of establishment there, isn't it? He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord... If I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set them before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? Now notice he hasn't uh, told them about Sarah, has he? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advancing in age, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why does Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Now, uh, you know, it doesn't say that that's exactly what she said, but the Lord perhaps heard that as well. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the time, at the set time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. Yeah. I think we could remember that God had spoken such a promise to Abraham and that he had also laughed to himself. We, we saw that. And Abraham's falling on his face implies maybe a more explicit negative response. You know, uh, We don't see Sarah uh, falling on her face in this situation. But... Um, but she is laughed out loud. Uh, the narrator inserts a word about their age in, in, uh, back in chapter 17, verse 17, and that Sarah no longer menstruates. We even know that from, from verse 11. Um, it says that she had, it had ceased to be with her as it had been with women, and I don't have all the... Uh, exegetical notes on that, but, um, but uh, the uh, Hebrew there is, is uh, rather clear what they're, what he's, what they're trying to say. Um, and so these comments soften Sarah's response. The fact that the narrator puts this in helps soften Sarah's response, that she's not so much um, 
an affront to these visitors as, as we might be if we didn't have that. Uh, and also her observation about the end of sexual pleasure. Uh, she says, uh, shall I have pleasure in verse 12? In other words, you know, you, 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 you're kidding, really? Um, because Abraham fathers other children in chapter 25. Long after she's dead. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, long after she's gone. So, you know, so this is, this is about her, her uh, difficulties, as it were, or, or difference, not difficulties, the change in her. So for Sarah, the issue has become more than barrenness. So God inquires about Sarah's laughter in verse 13. And if an accusatory question, then it could claim that Sarah could know better than to laugh, for nothing is too wonderful for God. Yet it seems unlikely that God would be critical of Sarah, if not of Abraham, back in chapter 17. So uh, we have a, either a dual standard, a double standard, or we have uh, the idea that we may be too quick sometimes to think that God is being critical of Sarah here. More likely, the why introduces a genuine question designed to continue the conversation. So Sarah's asking a question. Maybe she's not so incredulous. Maybe she wants to continue the conversation, especially if one or both of them do not know, uh, do not know God speaks in verse 10. And so God's question in verse 14 is also a genuine question. Let's see that again. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? That God is asking that, maybe not so much as a, as a, uh, in defense, but as a genuine question. Uh, is this story not just about Sarah's incredulity, but about God's surprise? Uh, that moves Abraham and Sarah beyond their limited view of the future to consider God's possibilities. So is there a time, and, and, and I would just pull out from that for a second to say, is there a time in our lives, and maybe we don't have to name an exact time, but think about it, where um, the joke that is played on, by, 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 by God, if you will, on the circumstances of your life, you know, that old oh my, old oh dear, what in the world moment in your life, is that one of God's ways of uh, not just telling you what for, but opening you to the possibilities that God has. Uh, you know, that all of a sudden this thing that, uh, now certainly not, not, not terrible tragedies, we're not looking for humor in, where, you know, in, in human suffering, but, um, but humor in circumstance and happenstance and, and serendipity and, um, and, and calling and, and uh, vocation and things like that. You know, the ways we move with God. Has God ever uh, surprised you and basically made the joke on you as a way of then helping you expand and see God's ways in greater, in greater uh, view? I think so. I think so. I think there are a lot of times when we could say that's happened to us, right? Yeah. So she denies her laughter in verse 15. It could be a lie. It could be an attempt to withdraw her laughter, some commentators think, uh, now being more aware of the nature of the moment. Haven't we all been in that situation where we, we thought, you know, we suddenly realized we had stuck our foot in our mouth or something like that? Uh, and, uh, and, and maybe she realized the possible identity of this one that's speaking to her, or these three, as it were. But the messenger says, it remains a fact. Oh, yes, you did laugh. And this keeps both Sarah and Abraham on the same level um, regarding the reception of the promise that they will have a son named, he laughs, he laughs. So Sarah's incredulous response belongs to a literary convention for such announcements. Um, if, you, if you have it, you may, want, you may can find 2 Kings. Let's see. 2 Kings 4, chapter 4, verse 16. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 16. This is the tale of uh, 
the Shunammite woman, uh, to the man of God who has come to visit her. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. And uh, let's see. You know what? I'll start, at, I'll start at verse 11. One day when he came there, he went up to the chamber and lay down there. He said to his servant, Gehazi, call the Shunammite woman. When, she, when he had called her, she stood before him. He said to her, say to her, he said to him, say to her, since you have taken all this trouble for us, what may be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I live among my own people. He said, what then may be done for her? Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. He said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood at the door. He said, At this season, in due time, you shall embrace a son. She replied, No, my lord, a man of God, do not deceive your servant. The woman conceived and bore a son in due season, in due time, as Elisha had declared to her. This idea then of the, uh, this, this, this happens in various places. This is a literary convention in the Bible of the announcement and then the person saying, no way, come on, bless you, saying, no way, come on, you can't be serious. Uh, that's something that happens several times in the Bible. And, uh, and, and hey, it, the humor is embedded there. It's not meant to be lost on us, but it's a, it's a way of contrasting our, way, our expectations and God's ways. Uh, you know, my kids like to say, mind blown. You ever, see, you ever hear them do that now? Or they'll, go, or they'll put their hands up here and they'll go, Pshaw! That's a sign of, you know, they just, whoa, that was cool, you know. Happens when we watch like a nature documentary or something and we see how this animal can do this thing. And we'll say, look. If if my wife got pregnant at this point in her life, I would not think it's funny. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Right? And you you may not be in the mood for uh, revelation from God about this idea. I don't think it's funny at all. You'd say, say, God, thank you very much. I, I think we, yeah, yeah. Another one, um, an, an announcement to a woman um, that came as a surprise. Can you think of one? Mary. 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 That's the other one. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other one. Mary. So, uh, you know, so say what? Or you talk about um, Zechariah, right? And he um, gets his mouth uh, shut um, because of his, uh, this announcement. So over and over again, you have this announcement theme. And that's a, that's a great example of that. Of that humor in the Bible, that uh, you got to be kidding, really, you know, and and how it is that that blows up our understanding, our minds, as it were, and we can see God's ways. So, <laughs> so that's a good sound effect for the humor stuff. Um, so now I want to uh, invite you to hear a story. Now, I would like to do, this will be like the latter part of our time, and then I have some discussion with you about this. Um, If you think of, now the the story about, uh, checking the time here, the story about Abraham and Sarah is a story with a lot of functions. It's a a, uh, covenant-making story or covenant-keeping story. It's a... Uh, historical, ancestral, kind of where did we come from, who are, who are we as Jews kind of uh, story. It, it's all these different functions, has lots of functions. And it's, of course, as I said, it's the surprise. But it's also, I would suggest, a, an evangelism story, an evangelism story uh, in which God visits the Abraham and Sarah and tells them good news. Now, depending on your perspective, right? And depending on their perspective, as, uh, as Jim pointed out too, you know, uh, what's good news to one person might not be, uh, what, you know, or what God see, thinks is good news, depending on your perspective, you may not feel like it's all that, all that grand or great until uh, at least at the moment. So if it's an evangelism story, I want to share with you another evangelism story. This was written by Will Willimon, um, our bishop in our church, but he wrote it back in 1978, and it went in the Christian century. And it's a story uh, called The Evangelization of a Family Named Fulp. You may have heard Fulp, F-U-L-P. Has anybody heard this? Jim, you remember this one? This was a little, this was like a, a little obscure story. It's cute. 
Let me read this to you. In a sparsely populated corner of southern Iowa, there lived a farm family by the name of Fulp. There were six Fulps. They farmed a hundred acre plot of corn wedged between broad expanses of wheat fields with an occasional house. The Fulps subsisted on what they grew in their garden, plus canned salmon, three turkeys a year, shredded wheat, and one carton of soft drinks per week. The Fulps were contented folks who, remind, who minded their own business and gave rides to hitchhikers if they passed any when they drove their pickup truck into town seven miles away for groceries each Saturday afternoon. They usually voted a straight Republican ticket. On the 4th of July, they set off a few firecrackers. In winter, they mostly sat by the fire and watched reruns of Gilligan's Island and had popcorn and hot chocolate. On Saturday evenings, after all the little Fulps were in bed, Mr. and Mrs. Fulp each had a glass of Mogan David before retiring. <laughs> And on Sundays, they slept late, occasionally arising in time to watch Oral Roberts. No Fulp had ever been a member of anything, except for Mr. Fulp's brief stint in the American Legion after the war. The Fulps were not opposed to clubs or organized activities. The fact of the matter was they had never been moved to seek membership. When a Fulp needed, felt the need of companionship or intellectual stimulation, he or she simply sat down with another fulp, or else just forgot about it. One October, the Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian churches in town got worked up, worked up over evangelism and launched a big community crusade to attract the unchurched. The Lutherans were worked up too, but since they were between pastors, they decided not to participate. <laughs> the churches rented a billboard on the road into town and posted a message for the unchurched with a phone number for them to call if they were interested. The churches also took out a full page ad in the weekly newspaper. Remember this is 78, so these was, this was mass communication in 78. The churches took out a full page ad in the weekly newspaper listing the hours when they had worship services. Prayer and study groups met each week in members' homes in town to study why the unchurched were the way they were and to pray that they would change. They studied a book by a religion professor at Wilson College available for $3.50 from Artos Publishers Incorporated. The Methodists and Baptists met each night, each night for a week, sang some songs, prayed, took up a collection, and heard an evangelist from Texas who told them that their churches would dry up and die and be as bad off as the Episcopalians if they did not get some new members and if there was not a rebirth of commitment to Christ. The Methodists hired an expert from Nashville who came in for a day and told them about the church growth movement and said what they needed was to reach out and love and go and where the, where the people were. The Methodists decided to start a bridge club in their fellowship hall for the town's senior citizens. As for the Baptists, they hired a man from Nashville who came in for a day and told them that what they needed to do was do a community religious survey to determine where the unchurched were to ask them why they were unchurched and to get them churched. The Baptists did the survey, knocking on every door within a 10 mile radius. The survey revealed that the, that the pickings were slim, so far as the unchurched were concerned. One lapsed Roman Catholic, an angry Baptist who was still mad about having lost out in that row over the church parking lot, and a woman who said that she went out of town to visit her aunt every weekend. These were the sole prospects to be found, except for a family outside of town by the name of Fulp. When the two women from the Baptist church, accompanied by a woman from the Presbyterian church, called on the Fulps, they were welcomed warmly by Mrs. Fulp, who offered them coffee, and the, by the little Fulps, who, in responding to the women's questions, informed them that they were 5, 8, 10, and 14, respectively and that Mr. Fulp was fixing the gears on the tractor. After a while, Mr. Fulp came in and the women talked to him too. The women, upon discovering that the Fulps were utterly unchurched, encouraged them to decide on one of the town's churches and to start attending. They also urged the little Fulps to come to Sunday school where they would be with lots of other nice boys and girls. The Presbyterian admitted that her church had too few children to have a Sunday school but added that they did have a nice young minister fresh out of seminary. 
One of the leaders from the Baptist church told Mrs. Fulp that the Baptists taught only the Bible in their Sunday school and that their church youth group went on a choir tour to New Orleans every spring. The Fulps listened politely, asked no questions, thanked the women for coming and told them to come back anytime they wished. Mr. Fulp excused himself and went out back to work on the tractor. Rushing back into town, the women alerted their pastors to the plight of the Fulps. One said she detected that the Fulps seemed to be searching for something. Another visitor noted that Mrs. Fulp had a pleasant voice and could probably sing in the church choir. The pastor speculated that Mr. Fulp was probably your irresponsible type of father, but that he could possibly be reached if he were visited by a couple of the businessmen from town. The response of the churches and their members was immediate and gratifying. A prayer group covenanted to pray for the Fulps each day at noon and 4.30. The owner of the Ford dealership in town volunteered to call on Mr. Fulp, while a delegation of women called on Mrs. Fulp in six separate occasions taking her a chocolate pie and a cassette recording of an inspirational address by Dale Evans. Members of the youth group at the Baptist Church decided to adopt the Fulps as their fall project and to have a party for the two older Fulp children. The Methodists focus on the two younger Fulps, mailing them a We Missed You postcard each Sunday after Sunday school. And local merchants were asked to watch for the Fulps when they came into town on Saturday afternoons and to try to get a commitment from them to attend church the next day. All of the ministers called upon the Fulps every week, each one leaving a stack of membership materials from his church and a copy of the upper room. The Methodist minister spent an afternoon explaining in some detail the Methodist social principles and clarifying why the church's general board of discipleship had recently gone on record in favor of binding arbitration in labor disputes. The Fulps themselves were a bit overwhelmed by all the attention. <laughs> the little folks started attending church, which meant that they were hardly ever home anymore. Mrs. Fulp now spent most of her day on the telephone talking to women from the various churches or listening to her latest cassette of The Total Woman. And Mr. Fulp stopped making the weekly pilgrimage into town on Saturday with his family since he felt harassed in every store where they shopped. He also started avoiding Mrs. Fulp after she returned from town one Saturday with a pair of hot pink baby doll pajamas. <laughs> Eventually, Mr. and Mrs. Fulp stopped speaking to each other altogether after a three-hour argument one night over provenient grace. And the 14-year-old Fulp, who had learned to smoke on a recent youth retreat to New Orleans, was becoming insufferably rebellious. Finally, the pressure got to Mr. Fulp. And one night after their new practice of family devotionals, he climbed into his, family, into his pickup truck and headed for Des Moines, never to be heard from again. It is assumed that he probably perished there as a wino, following several months of dissipation. The younger folks became regular Sunday school attenders, two at the Baptist Church and one at the Methodist Church. But the eldest folk offspring ran away with a 17-year-old Margarette Majorette while they were in New Orleans together on the spring choir tour. And from New Orleans they made their way to California where it is rumored that they now live together out of wedlock. And Mrs. Fulp sold the farm and moved into town where she was led to join the Presbyterian Church. An action on her part which led nearly half of the women in town to vow to never speak to her again. And which led the Methodist minister to phone the Presbyterian minister and tell him what he thought of his proselytizing. The Baptist minister said that he had detected early in his acquaintance with Mrs. Fulp that she was emotionally unstable and he hoped that the Presbyterians could give her whatever it was she was looking for. Mrs. Fulp now does workshops in parent effectiveness training and can be booked through the Presbyterian Senate office at 203 McGuire Street, Iowa City, Iowa, 52240. <laughs> Take that in, huh? So, the question is, contrast the evangelization of Abraham and Sarah. Of course, they were already God, they were already believers, but uh, this visit by them, by God to them, with the evangelization of the folks. 
how did God do it better than we did? <laughs> mm -hmm. What did God do? There's no particular answer, you know, right answer. I just want to get your thoughts. What did God do? Basically, what? He said you will be blessed. I mean, that's entirely mm. different than what the other evangelist was. Mm-hmm. You will be blessed. Yeah. Brought them a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other than the names, he didn't change. Them. Ah, other than their names, he didn't. The point wasn't to change them, essentially. And if they changed, it was because. Um, yeah, because of grace and yeah, yeah, yeah. How did how did God see Abraham and Sarah in contrast to how did God how did the churches see the folks? How did God see Abraham and Sarah? That he loved them. Loved them and yeah, yeah. yeah. The folks isn't just numbers. Yeah. 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 A project. To be, because they didn't yeah. go to church, then they were mm -hmm. not there. Mm-hmm. 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 Something less than. Mm-hmm. Maybe the minister had a back row that was empty. I know, right? I know. <laughs> That's impossible. Or or a front row. Most of the time, it's the front rows that are empty, and not the back. The back. The people sit in the back, right? Yeah, you got to go to a Lutheran church very early. To yes. Get the back row. Yes. Yes. Come early and get a back seat. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh huh. The balconies. Yeah. What do these stories tell us about ourselves, or at least this contrast? What does that? What kind of things does that tell us about uh, how we how we can be sometimes? Because remember, the whole point of humor is how we are and how God would have us be, and the gap between that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think when our egos take over. <laughs> Yeah. Nothing good happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that we're often very quick to judge people mm -hmm. too much. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to be able to judge, you know, when opening up and witnessing yeah. uh, becomes pushing and aggravating. Yeah. When it's help when is it helpful and when is it not? Helpful is a good word I like to come back to, I guess, for that kind of thing. It's like, you know, what's the ultimate goal? To, to, have, to have them have a blessing, a sense of being known by God and in covenant with God through Jesus Christ, uh, like Abraham and Sarah had this visit, you know. And uh, what if we are um, gracious ambassadors, you know, of God as, uh, and, 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 and love people and, and, and not to seek to win, you know, winning, winning, the whole term winning souls is, and it's kind of laden. And I mean, I think it's how can we be no less um, uh, urgent and no less committed to making disciples of Jesus Christ, but do that as, um, as the way God does and not, not necessarily the way we always go to. It yes. Everything went wrong when the churches started competing. Like the competing. Mm -hmm. The competing. They weren't mm -hmm. thinking about the family. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be the church. Right. The right. There's no um, reference, at least in the story, to uh, the to the discipleship of Christ. You know, in the folks, it's about getting them in the, you know, on your team, as it were. Yeah, Doug. Well, God sees a future for Abraham and Sarah, and mm -hmm. He's describing it to them. Mm -hmm. you know? This is this is the way I see way in the future mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. what you all are about to mm -hmm. become a part of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was nothing like that <laughs> with the folks. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to yeah. fill a pew and get the right, <clears throat> get right. The people to come to church. Right, <clears throat> right. Uh, hence the. Yeah, yeah. So, and a lot of obviously a lot of the humor in the story is because uh, we uh, we see the um, foolishness. Yeah, we see ourselves, and we see right, and the and the and and see ourselves in that way. Yeah. So, okay. Next time. Oh, uh, and and well, I think we addressed that. What does it tell us about how to share the good news? We we talked about that too in this. Yes, ma'am. I just have to 
put a plug in for our Sunday school class. Yes. We read Adam Hamilton's yeah. Christmas, What Christians Do Wrong. Yes, that's a good example, a good, good, a good reference, and that's right, and a, and a great Sunday school class, by the way, too. Yeah, Adam Hamilton's book, What Christians Do Wrong, um, and uh, yeah, that's a good one. I'm trying to think, if I, and if I think of others too, I, I meant to, I should have made a, a further reading on this uh, slide, and we would put that there. That'd be great. Yeah, good. Um, next time we're going to talk about uh, Balaam and his donkey and uh, and the idea of um, basically God acting in the absurd, the absurd. And now that's not a again, you get me. That's not a criticism of of the authority of the Bible. Um, the authority of the Bible is there. It's and the authority of the Bible is saying. Look how God had to act through this absurd donkey to get Balaam's attention. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's upholding the uh, authority of the Bible. Uh, and uh, we'll look at that and we'll see how God um, sometimes speaks to us through the absurd and how uh, God says, uh, uh, God shakes us and grabs us by the, by the, by the uh, shoulder and lapel and how shakes us. I thought about that too. I know. And he he entertained them for a while there. They didn't, they didn't have an ice box to go uh, keep some some fresh calf in, did they? Man, I thought about that too. That did occur to me. Yeah. All right. Okay. This was really fun. It was really great. And I'll have a couple more funny comics in there too next time. Okay. May we pray to uh, to go forth? Thank you, God, for sharing with us not only the joke but the grace. And, uh, and, and sharing with us and showing us uh, how to find you in not only in the Bible but in uh, everyday life and in the absurdities and profundities uh, that happen um, in our lives. Uh, Lord, um, uh, help us hear and notice and know your ways such that, uh, you, uh, that your surprises to us uh, can be gentle and, uh, and, and that... Uh, but yet, nevertheless, we honor today your persistence in getting through to us. Uh, you will use anything to get through to us. And as we'll talk next, and as we'll learn next week, God, you will use anybody and anything to get through to us. So send us uh, with hope and with good humor as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you.